Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Inside ETFs weekly webinar. My name is John Swolf, and I'm the Vice President and Head of the EMEA Business here at Inside ETFs, and I will also be your host for today's webinar. In today's webinar, we'll take a look at how to position your portfolio for rising rates. Like the boy who cried wolf, we've been talking about the threat of rising rates for years. But with the, five, with the Fed finally on the path for hiking rates and with inflation starting to creep into wages and other factors, we've gathered the smartest minds we know to debate, discuss, and determine what investors should do uh, now to prepare for the inevitable tomorrow. In today's webinar, we will ask, how fast will rates rise in the coming months? Should you own bonds at all in this environment? And if so, which ones? How can you actually profit from rising rates? What is one of the fixed income investments you should avoid in the year to come? Here to join me is an absolutely amazing panel of experts. Kim Arthur is the president and CEO of Maine Management, one of the longest standing and best ETF strategists on the market. Joe Castigli III is a financial analyst with Merrill Lynch, where he is part of the RKMS Group. Tyler Finney is the sales director for Riverfront, another of the largest and most successful ETF strategists on the market. And Bob Smith is simply the smartest man I know on bonds and is the president uh, and CEO of Sage Advisory Services, the world's leading fixed income ETF strategist. Uh, but that's not all. Uh, we also have Bill Belden, managing director and head of ETF business development uh, for Guggenheim. He is here to give us an overview on new research into the equal weight uh, ETF RSP. Among other things, he, he'll offer us a startling statistic you can use on your financial geek friends answering how many of the smallest companies in the S&P 500 does it take to add up to the weight uh, of Apple alone? The answer will surprise you. We've got equal weight, rising rates, and how to position your portfolio for the future. It's one hell of a show. Uh, it's the Inside ETFs weekly webinar. Okay, Bill, let's get started with your sponsored segment. Here we dig into one awesome ETF that investors everywhere should consider for their portfolios. Today, you're going to be talking about RSP, the Guggenheim S&P 500 Equal Weight ETF. You have five minutes to explore that fund, uh, and then we'll bring in the panel. Bill, take it away. John, thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for uh, dialing in uh, today. As John mentioned, I want to feature the Equal Weight Alternative, which uh, – uh, f focuses on the Guggenheim S&P 500 Equal Weight ETF, which trades under the ticker RSP. Uh, three primary points we want to highlight for RSP, which uh, first, which is the performance potential of that particular strategy uh, as a reflection of its demonstrated history of outperforming. We came out with RSP back in April of 2003 as the what we like to call the first strategic or smart beta ETF that was launched into the space that really removed market cap weighting from the equation. So performance potential is uh, the first feature. Um, secondly, we really want to position RSP uh, as a large cap core allocation. We'll provide some compelling statistics that support that notion. And then third, you know, more generally as it relates to ETFs, particularly on the equity side, is the tax efficiency associated with that particular wrapper. And when you're dealing with a strategy like equal weight, um, where there's a very dynamic approach to getting that exposure to, uh, to equity markets, uh, tax efficiency is a key component. So drilling down into each one of those uh, facets that I just mentioned, first, the historical outperformance. If you look there on the chart uh, in front of you, you see the history of RSP in contrast to the S&P 500 index. So very quickly, an equal weight approach to a particular strategy takes each one of the constituents in the universe, in this case the S&P 500, and applies the same weight to it, which contrasts with market cap weighting, which uh, assigns the weighting within the universe according to the market capitalization of the individual stock. So as opposed to your Apples, your Microsofts, your ExxonMobils, et cetera, which have significant weightings within the S&P 500, each one of the names in RSP has – uh, an equal weight, and then perhaps more importantly, that equal weight is uh, repositioned on a quarterly basis when a rebalance is done, and the rebalance basically takes or sells uh, positions and names that have appreciated during the preceding quarter and adds those proceeds to the names that have uh, depreciated or appreciated less than other names. So you're going back to that equal weight, and it's really that disciplined approach that's added a lot of value there. I did talk about RSP as a core equity holding, of course, and the statistics shown there on the right-hand side 
uh, demonstrate its history of outperformance as a core equity holding. Um, we went back and took a look at the performance of RSP in contrast to the S&P 500 since it launched in April of 2003 and, and found that any 10-year window using rolling monthly returns, uh, every 10-year uh, window using rolling monthly returns, I should say, uh, RSP outperformed the S&P 500, which is a really compelling proof point to positioning RSP as a core equity holding. However, if you want to hold it for uh, shorter periods of time, certainly the value and the history of performance there supports its use in that manner as well as you see 84% for five years, 71% for three years, and 57% over one-year histories uh, certainly support its use to the extent that you choose to overweight using RSP as opposed to exclusively use it as a core equity holding. Some of the analysis went on to do some attribution work on RSP's outperformance, and the attribution we did on the outperformance that RSP has delivered against the S&P 500, which shows that 91.5% outperformance over that 14-and-a-half-year history, uh, basically we looked at you know, what is attributable to stock selection, which in this case is the rebalance, and what is attributable to sector allocation, which is the byproduct of the equal weight approach. And we found that 80% of that 91.5% uh, outperformance was attributable to the rebalance effect. So really it is that disciplined buying and selling that takes place on a quarterly basis, which is where you get the value uh, within the equal weight approach in contrast to market cap weighting, which doesn't have a rebalance whatsoever. It just continues to add on to those names that uh, appreciate in value. Finally, ETFs uh, are highlighted for their tax efficiency in general, but really quantifying that value sometimes is, uh, is understated. And if you look at uh, you know, the history of RSP, which again, appointed to a 14 plus year uh, life uh, of delivering 300 plus percent in total return, yet there has not been one uh, capital gain uh, provided within RSP throughout that entire lengthy history. And if you contrast that against appears in the Morningstar Large Cap Blend ETF and mutual fund category, you really get to see how that benefit is quantified. Uh, you see there at a minimum, you get 40 basis points uh, in the, some of the lighter years and north of 160 basis points in the more uh, impactful years, if you will, as it relates to capital gains paid out in competing products, particularly on the mutual fund side of things. And as we find ourselves in now November of 2017, coming off of the equity market performance that we've all enjoyed and, uh, and noting the fact that equity mutual funds have been in net redemption this year uh, shapes up to be a pretty significant year by most accounts as it relates to capital gain distribution. So tax efficiency is perhaps as important as it's ever been in your investments and we'd encourage you to take a look at ETFs in general but in particular look at something with a history like RSP behind it as we expect to also passed through 2017 without paying a capital gain this year as well. We did just put together a website uh, that we'd encourage you to take a visit, um, a pay visit to, which is equalweight.com. Uh, we, we have a lot of information on RSP itself, but also information on equal weighting as it applies to other market segments, including uh, the equal weight sectors, including the S&P 400, S&P 600, and S&P 100. So uh, take a look at uh, equalweight.com. There's also some additional uh, sector research that could support your evaluation of where to invest from a sector perspective. Um, and we just launched that, so please take a look. I'll pass along the RSP performance that I talked about in graphical form earlier, highlighting one other point too, which is we just reduced the fee for RSP from 40 to 20 basis points earlier this year. So uh, the value that's been provided over that history at a 40 basis point level is now applied uh, or available at 20 basis points, making uh, that much more value available to shareholders. Thank you so much for that, Bill. We appreciate you taking the time uh, to join us. Thank you, John. So now we want to uh, – you're welcome. So we want to go ahead now and jump into uh, our big picture conversation of the week, how to position your portfolio for rising rates. Uh, let's start big, and we'll narrow down from there. Uh, with rising rates just around the corner, should I own bonds at all in my portfolio? Uh, Bob, I know you and Matt are kicking off the Inside Fixed Income Conference tomorrow with that same question. Um, so let's start with you. Should I own bonds at all? 
Uh, sure, John. Thank you for that question. Um, you know, I can't help but feel, like you had mentioned, that we've been in this kind of nervous Nelly twist now since 2010. The headlines have been just, oh, my God, it's going to happen now. Oh, my God. And for year after year, we have been sitting here wearing ourselves silly that rates are going to go super sky high. And now I think we're at that Game of Thrones moment where King John of House Stark is overlooking the wall and saying winter is coming. Uh, A little foreboding for me, but I guess that's the way everybody likes to think about interest rates, and I think it's kind of nonsensical. When you sit down and think about why fixed income, fixed income is an excellent diversifier to risk risk asset. That hasn't finished. In fact, that's even more so today than it ever has been in the past. Let me tell you, over the course of the 10 worst drawdowns that we've had in fixed income over the course of the last, oh, three decades, going all the way back to 1980, you know what the average average down quarter was for the ag in the 10 worst periods? A negative 3.7%. Golly gee, that great diversifier known as stocks, that must have been just roaring during those quarters. You know what you earned on stocks? 50 basis points on average during those quarters. Now let's flip that story around and let's look at what stocks have done and what bonds have done. So let's look at the 10 worst quarters for stocks going back to 1980. You know what the average of those returns were for stocks, okay? A negative 15.3% for the S&P 500. And yet, during that period of time, the average return for the ag was a hearty 3% during all of those down periods. I rest my case. This is a diversifier case if there ever was one. I'll take you one step further. Over the course of the last 10 years, year by year, calendar year by calendar year, do you realize that there has been a stock, or rather a bond uh, sector, if you take the top eight sectors, treasuries, agencies, mortgage-backed, corporates, U.S. corporates, U.S. junk, emerging market debt. You take those, and PIPs, you take those eight sectors, you line them up, calendar year by calendar year, you realize that one or more of those sectors, each and every year, they three, beat the pants off the S&P 500 for that same year. So 80% of the time, there's a fixed income sector in those top eight that is going to hand it to the S&P 500. The range, the average range of opportunity in fixed income over this period of time, over these last 15 years, has been a hearty 18% on average each and every year. So what does that say? Be tactical and be active in your fixed income management. My God, do not index. Index at this point and sitting in the ag, probably the worst thing you could do right now. So I think that there's a case for active fixed income management. I think there's a case for diversification. And given that we've had now two back-to-back really chubby years for equities, I'd be more concerned about what I'm going to be paying up for equities, particularly with the policy backdrop that we see right now, which is a little bit jittery and questionable. I think we have a concern about whether or not we should be throwing all of our fixed income babies out with the bathwater. On I'll give you one last little historical perspective. If you're really right. concerned, yeah, yeah, give us one last one. Go ahead. Go, go ahead for it, Bobby. Yeah, give us one last little tidbit, please. Yeah. yeah, sure. Rising rate environments. I went back, looked over 20 years, and I went through and I found the four worst corrections in terms of interest rate moves uh, going back to uh, the uh, late 1990s. And in those moves, the average move on the 10-year Treasury was a backup of 199 basis points. Treasuries during those period of time, 10-year Treasury, lost about 1.19%. And nothing to lose your, your lunch over. But you know what? The intermediate gov credit index during those downdrafts, those horrible downdrafts, was actually a positive 2.14%. You actually made money. So fixed income, it's not down and out, and don't count it out, because I think it's going to be here to help uh, diversify and help grow returns over a reasonable period of time. Well, I think we all know where Bob lies uh, on this side of the argument uh, with that impassioned uh, cry to continue to own, Bob, to, to own bonds. But what I want to do, uh, Tyler, is I want to ask you a very similar question. Uh, but before we get into that, I want to quote something from a research paper uh, that your team put together. Uh, I believe that this came out uh, in January or so. Our first line of defense in our balanced portfolios is to underweight bonds versus equities. We prefer bonds that act somewhat like stocks high yield and investment grade over treasuries. Your team put that together in January and it turned out to be the right call. Uh, But my question is, if you want to be underweight bonds, why not be zero weight? Should I own them at all? Sure, yeah. Um, You know, 
the question or the qu next question I would ask is, well, how much time will you give me if, um, if you know, if I were the advisor to the client? Because if you give me, you know, I'm in my late 20s, I, I'm fine in an all equity portfolio. You know, my time frame is well over 10 years. Um, the, you know, for the retiree, I, I have a hard time believing they'd be able to sleep at night with a 100% equity portfolio. Um, and so, one, the way we build our portfolios here at Riverfront, especially our balanced ones, um, is where if you give us, if you invest in our five-year portfolio, we, inv we invest it in a way where if history is any guide, if you invest in our five-year portfolio and, and name your nightmare, 08 happens tomorrow, we will at least retain the principal you gave us. Um, and so, you know, if you in the open it in our moderate growth income in 2004 um, and closed it in April of 2009, you retained 100%. You can't make that promise. Um, having little to no fixed income in the portfolio, especially in the sort of shorter time horizons, um, and especially for the mind mindset of a, a retiree, especially that fall into that three and five year category. Um, so, you know, our take is, is you know, we certainly you know, like it a lot less than we did back in January, even a year and a half ago when, when oil was hitting 26, was when we were, really got in to the high space or the high yield space pretty heavily. Um, so our answer would be, you know, that the less time you give us, we're going to have more of it in there, um, more, more for downside protection, not because we like it. Um, and, you know, the longer time frame you give us, the more we're going to be overweight equity and uh, more overweight, um, and particularly the developed international space, because uh, you're also getting an income component over there as well. Yeah, thank you for that, Tyler. Certainly, I think what we, we've established so far today is that there is uh, a couple reasons to own bonds. But, Joe, I want to move on a little bit and focus here on, on rising rates. So I know that you manage portfolios for, for high-end clients. Uh, my two-part question for you is, one, is rising rates a concern, um, and what are you doing to position clients for the new rate regime uh, in the future? Uh, thanks, John. So, the way that we manage money here, uh, the RKMS Group of Merrill Lynch, is that we take a smart beta approach uh, across all our portfolios, but specifically to fixed income. Uh, we use momentum techniques to identify opportunities across the broader fixed income market, and we do that by using a quantitative rules-based algorithm that r removes emotion and bias from the investment selection process and helps us optimize our portfolios for duration, credit quality, and yield. So with that in mind, uh, um, I mean, of course, we're concerned about rising rates, but we're not necessarily concerned in how far, how fast. We're more concerned with the shape of the curve and how it affects the individual, uh, what are the responses of the individual asset classes to the move in interest rates. Um, so just as an example, if, if you were to look at the prior rate hike cycle from 2004 to 2006, and I think a few people have alluded to this, that we've been talking about rates rising basically since the beginning of QE. Um, and it's, that, that call has largely been incorrect. And if you look at that rate, previous rate hiking cycle, you, you can see that the, the back end of the curve, after initial jump in the entire curve, people start piling into the front end to protect themselves, but what actually has happened is the front end continues to move higher and you have a flattening where the back end continues to move lower. So it makes for a lot of very attractive opportunities on the back end, which is sort of counter counterintuitive to shortening up your duration and minimizing your interest rate risk. Gotcha. For that. Joe, I'd appreciate that. Um, Kim, kind of moving along those same lines and, and keeping the topic of, of rising rates, um, one, how, how do you position clients uh, and are rising rates a concern? And then the other question I have for you is, um, you guys are famous for your uh, sector equity strategies. Is there a sector play that, that protects clients from rising rates? So your two questions there are, uh, are rising rates a concern and how do you position clients? And then can you use a sector play uh, as a defense against those rising rates? Did we lose Kim? He might be on mute. I don't know if we have Kim with us still. All right. Well, you know what, Joe? I actually have another question for you. And if Kim gets back on the line, we will uh, hey, we'll hey, go John, ahead and John, turn it over. John, you just came oh. back. John. Hey, John. It's Kim. Yes, you just came you, back there. It went totally blank. Yep. Ah, uh, sorry, Kim. So, uh, Kim, I had a, a question for you. Is um, how do you position clients uh, during rising rates, and are they a concern for them? And the other question is, uh, you're famous for your sector equity strategy. Is there a sector play uh, that protects clients from rising rates? Great, John. Thanks a lot. 
Um, yeah, so we do focus a lot on fundamentals and sectors and trying to find out where we can kind of be um, in the right place, find, trying to find out where, where, where we can be to catch that wave. So if you look from our standpoint, rates are rising because global growth is going up. Right now you've got global growth that's broken out of the 3% trend range and is, and is moving towards a 4%. So that actually is good for equities, which is why we've seen pretty robust equity markets around the globe here. And I think when you drill down specifically, if you're looking for sectors or areas that make a lot of sense, the financial space, which right now for the S&P is a 15% weighting, the max weighting that that's been historically is 22%. So it hasn't been completely arbed out yet. Um, and if you look on the price to book is 1.4 times versus a 20-year average, which is 1.4 times. So that is, is very well positioned. It's lagged on the year. The regional banks have lagged the market as we have had fewer rate hikes. Um, and you can also keep in mind that regulation has gone down significantly and these banks are overcapitalized. So that's one area to look at. The second is housing. If you look at the fact that starts are still 10% below their 20-year average, you look at the mortgage payment as a percent of your income, it's one-third below the 40-year average. That's obviously because the uh, mortgages are below 4% versus historic at 8 So that's still a sector, the housing that can still do extremely well. And then the last would be a global reflation. Global GDP is going higher. You want to look at uh, commodity-based pieces like metals and mining, like XME, um, that would play into both the global GDP and then the uh, the growth re the growth reflation going on. Thank you for that, Kim. And Kim, I actually want to stay with you um, and have another question for you. So, um, obviously, fixed income is two words: fixed and income. Uh, we've covered the concern about how fixed your return will be in fixed income. Um, but what do you do for clients who want income? How are you finding income in today's low rate environment? Yeah, so, John, what we do uh, in, our, in our space here for our clients, we actually do call writing strategies to generate income for clients. So, we'll, again, we'll find a, a basket of, of sectors, um, styles, and groups that, that we think are, are fairly to, uh, undervalued, and then we'll start doing covered calls. You can do deep in the money calls on them. You can do uh, out of the money uh, calls depending on what your what your uh, price objective is, but that's what we have found um, for us is working. And if we do get a rising rate environment, you would start to see higher volatility. So your premiums that you're bringing in, which have been extremely muted right now, would start to go up. So uh, call writing strategies uh, should work and have been working very well for income generation. Thanks for that, Kim. And it makes a lot of sense. So I know you guys have been running that strategy for years and have had tons of success. Um, Joe, I have a similar question for you. Um, what does your income strategy look like when investors have bid up everything with the yield? Is there anywhere you can turn for an income strategy? So basically using our fixed income, the same principles that are behind our fixed income strategies, we, we've adapted that to create a, a high income strategy that we call our global high income. And effectively, that's, that's going to look across the, the world of ETFs. And all of our strategies, we, we use ETFs exclusively in all of them. Um, we could go into that in terms of a number of reasons why we choose ETFs over using individual bonds. Um, but just to, to answer the question, Effectively, we use our, our, our same quantitative rules-based algorithm. Uh, we optimize it for income in this, in this particular case where we would look at the entire – look at a number of um, high-income ETFs across asset classes, across geographic locations, and then we would optimize to, to get the highest possible income and, and use lowest possible standard deviation. So we're not All right. Thanks for that. Okay. We're, we're, we're not necessarily looking specific to income. We're just optimizing the income and, and still kind of having a total return focus with it. All right. Gotcha. Thank you. Uh, Bob, so I, I want to turn to you. And we have just about five minutes left and a few questions to, to get through. So let's, let's see if we can power through these guys. Um, 
So in your pre-conference interview with, with Matt Hogan, you said that everything dies in a rising rate environment, stocks, bonds, et cetera. Um, does anything do well, and is there anywhere to hide? Well, it, again, it depends on, on for how long and how high the whole thing goes. It, the worst of all worlds is going to be a, a shock, rapidly rising, and very, very poor communication. Uh, let's talk about Chairman Greenspan in 1994. The guy couldn't communicate his way out of a paper bag, shocked the system unnecessarily harsh, and uh, you ended up with one of the, the worst fixed income outcomes possible. I think there were a lot of lessons that were learned by the Federal Reserve and by other international central bankers. Communicate, 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 almost to a fault. So I think that we're not going to have a repeat of that. Definitely what you want to be doing, just as the previous speaker had said, if you're going to read for income, I think it's time to kind of lift your head out of the, out of the bowl and don't be too much of a hog. Be very volatility sensitive. So we, like the previous speaker, we volatility adjust income. So for income people who are or people who are driven by income, we're going to vol adjust on a moving you know, three-year standard deviation. There are some interesting places still, even in today's world. You know, we look at, you know, obviously short high yield, senior bank loans, preferreds, even CMBS uh, on a volatility adjusted basis is giving you a fair return from an income perspective. Things like MLPs and some of the other crazy, more volatile areas, quite frankly, are a little rich from that perspective. How you play the curve. The worst part of the cycle, if you go back and look at the ag over the last four or five interest rate cycles, the worst part of the cycle is the front end of it. As you work your way through over the first six months or so, actually extending and actually being more aggressive away from treasuries and into spread product and so forth, it yields very good positive rates return. These things don't last forever. And so, you know, we would barbell uh, our, our yield curve distribution as one way of offsetting some of the risk rather than running entirely to the front end. I agree that we're in a bear and, and kind of a flattening trend, and it could probably flatten a bit more. Diversification is your key here, and again, getting away from treasuries and treasuries only at this point uh, is very important, and disaggregating the ag. If you're sitting here an indexed ag product in an ETF, you're going to get slaughtered. You're at the absolute historical wides in terms of how much yield does this thing give me versus how much duration do I have to accept for this. It looks like a pair of alligator jaws opening up about ready to swallow you. So disaggregate the ag, break it down to its component parts, and find the ones that are actually good value inside that uh, general ag and really overload or overweight those particular sectors that you trust and you feel most comfortable with. I think that's probably the bottom line. Thank you for that, Bob. So, Tyler, I want to move on, and we have just about three minutes or so to go, um, but we want to make sure that we talk a little bit about inflation. Um, and taking another quote from Riverfront's research, um, talking about inflation, your firm wrote, since 2008, Bernanke and Yellen have had their primary focus on achieving higher growth and preventing deflation. Bond investors uh, have not demanded a premium over the prevailing inflation rate. This suggests to us uh, that complacency about inflation is uh, pervasive and that bond investors have little or no protection should inflation accelerate. Do you still believe that to be true? We do. Um, you know, I don't think, you know, we, we've been talking recently about what we see as is, is, is a long-term disinflationary boom. Um, and so I, I don't think the, the pressures are there that we saw maybe back when we wrote it. Um, I think the Fed has, has indicated that they will be very slow and gradual. Um, and if, if growth is is maintained, we don't think it's going to accelerate enough to cause a much higher inflation rate. Um, so I think it's much more important to focus on the rate at which it goes up um, and not the fact that the Fed is raising just to raise. So um, in our view, we think the disinflationary boom uh, will continue, um, which will um, in turn, we think the ECB and the Bank of Japan will continue to print money. And, and while they print um, you know, with rates being low over there as well, it, it seems to be a gravity pull on U.S. rates as well. Um, so we think that will be contained in, in the near term as well. All right. And thank you. So, guys, we have literally a minute left to go, so I have one final quick question for you. Uh, and we'll start with Kim, and then we'll go to Joe, uh, Tyler, and we'll end with Bob. Um, what is the one thing you should do in your portfolio if you're worried about rising rates? Kim? Uh, if you're worried about rising rates here with, uh, associated with growth, I would get long equities, and I would do income-generating call writing. Joe? I would say that uh, over the past several years, years, there's been tremendous innovation in the ETF space, and uh, you, can, you can now use all sorts of different ETFs 
in the fixed home income space that hedge out duration risk and or even take on negative duration. Um, and, and those would definitely be tools that we would employ here. Thanks, Tyler. All right, I'd say be overweight equities across the board on the fixed income side, be very active um, and do not look anything like the egg. Gotcha. And Bob, real quick, 30 seconds, what would you do? I would be careful about where I am on the yield curve. It's a bear flattener. You distribute your maturities. Be very diversified uh, into higher yielding spread product. And if you think buying income producing equities is wonderful in a rising rate environment, I'll take you back a few cycles and show you how they got butchered. All right. Well, that's going to do it. We're all out of time. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining the Inside ETF's weekly webinar. Join us again next week where we bring in the legendary Richard Bernstein for an in-depth interview exploring where to invest in 2018 and beyond. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks for your time.